Good evening. It is 531 on May 12th, 2021. We call this board meeting um, to order. All trustees are present. And our first um, order of business is executive session. So at this time we will at 531, we will go into an executive session and then be back for um, open session and open forum. Thank you very much. My apologies. At this time, we will go into an executive session. Um, according to the board, will adjourn to close their executive session pursuant to Texas government section 551.071 and 551.074. So at this time at 532, we will now go into an executive session. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are back in open session at 540. We will go directly into open forum, and I do believe we have some that have signed up to speak tonight. So I will turn it now over to trustee Jorge Rodriguez for open forum. Uh, Jorge. Thank you. Next on the agenda is the open forum section of our board meeting. Any person who is not included. Any person who is not scheduled on the agenda may address the board during open forum by completing the request to speak form and submitting it to the executive director of communications prior to the meeting. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the board is restricted from discussing or taking action on, in, on items presented during the open forum if the item is not listed on tonight's agenda. If an issue mentioned is listed on tonight's agenda, board members may respond to comments when the agenda item is considered. In addition, this is not the forum that the district has provided to raise and resolve complaints about individual employees or students. We request the person speaking in open forum on items not on the agenda refrain from raising complaints against such individuals or personally identifying them in any way in the remarks unless it is pursuant to the district's grievance policies. Please contact the appropriate administrator to address your comments or concerns. There is, a gen there is generally a three minute time limit on individual presentations. If groups wish to speak on the same topic, the board may ask that a spokesperson be appointed to speak for the group. The board president may extend additional time as his or her discretion or shorten the allowed time for, for each speaker not to be less than two minutes. If the speaking requests are so num numerous as to hinder the orderly conduct of the board's meeting on pending business. Anyone wishing to speak either as an individual or as a representative of a group may do so at this time. Our first speaker is Ms. Megan Holliday. Uh, Ms. Holliday, you could uh, say your name and address, please. Yes, yes. Um, my name is is Megan Holiday, and I'm at 5135 Hayden Bend Circle in Grapevine. Um, and I know that this isn't an agenda item, but I just wanted to make sure that I um, said this. So I would like to start by thanking each of you for your dedication to our school district. I know that you typically hear more complaining during these open forums than praise, but I truly wanted to express my appreciation as a parent for all of the hard work that has been put into this school year to ensure that our kids have a safe, healthy and stable learning environment. I know for a fact that not everyone can say these things about their districts. I would also like to admit that prior to this year, I have stuck my head in the sand when it comes to the work that is done and the information that is discussed at these school board meetings. I know these are long and grueling, but what is decided, what is decided impacts all of our students. While COVID definitely impacted many people in a negative way, I have tried to view some of the positives, one of which has been these meetings being made available live virtually. While I know it is exponentially more work for all of you and Mr. Berger, and probably allows for more parent feedback than you would prefer, I would like to request that the board consider making virtual attendance of the school board meetings an option even after this year. I know most people outside of a few have the ability or desire, no offense, to attend a five plus hour meeting. However, I have stayed more informed and in the know this year more than ever, and even attending virtually has given me a true respect for the hours and dedication that each of you has for GCISD. Thank you for your time and consideration.
Thank you, Ms. Holliday. The next speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Meyer. Uh, Mr. Meyer, you could tell your name and address, please. Yes, my name is Jeff Marler. I'm at 1403 Bel Air Drive. I'm a licensed speech language pathologist with a private practice in Grapevine. My wife and I have been here nine years and three of our children went through the Grapevine uh, schools. I'm, I'm requesting that the um, GCISD Board of Trustees add to the agenda for the May 24th board meeting a motion to return to in-person board meetings going forward. Um, I, so I just, I just heard the uh, uh, last speaker's comment about um, uh, the ease of the uh, uh, virtual and um, I understand that that is easier for some people, but I think for transparency of the board and I'm not really sure that if, you know, if we really have things that we need to speak to the board about that being at a long meeting should uh, inhibit us from coming. So I'd really appreciate it if you would put that on the agenda. I, I think it would be an opportunity for the board of trustees to demonstrate uh, leadership and transparency to, um, uh, the folks who uh, uh, take such uh, f feel that the schools are as important as they are. They're very important. What goes on here is important. Our ability as parents to be able to participate is important as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marler. The next speaker is Stetson Clark. Mr. Clark, you could stay your name and address, please. Hey, my name is Stetson hey, Clark. My name is Stetson Clark. I live at 3410 Spring Tree Drive. I'm also calling a calling to request that an agenda item be added to the GCISD Board of Trustees meeting agenda for the May 24th meeting. While virtual is great, and I believe it should continue and people should be able to call in, we should also have the ability to see the faces of the people we are discussing the education of our children with. I would appreciate if you added an agenda to that or an agenda item to the board meeting to be voted on for the May 24th meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Our next speaker is uh, Jesus Mendoza and we'll be calling him, right? Kim. Okay, this is Kim with the Great Mount Colleyville School District. Uh huh. If you could state your name and address, and you will have three minutes to address the board. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jesus Mendoza, and my phone number is 956-583-7012. I have been homebound <clears throat> for more than 10 years with a light threatening electro hypersensitivity, EHS, which is caused and aggravated by exposure to the same wireless microwave radiation reaching children and teachers at school. I have been violently ill several times. I'm in sleep deprived and in pain all the time. Every day is a different torture. This is a horrible way to die. <clears throat> My EHS has been recognized by federal and state agencies and by courts as a physical medical condition <clears throat> and proves conclusively that exposure to radiation below the federal safety limits causes severe harm and disabilities and that exposing children to microwave radiation defeats the purpose of education. It is estimated that without knowing, more than 50% of the population is already suffering symptoms of EHS. Children, teachers, doctors, attorneys, and even a director of the World Health Organization are suffering from EHS. Please see we are the evidence.org. Despite that EHS is reaching pandemic proportions, most doctors are in the dark on denial and continue misdiagnosing and mistreating with harmful drugs 
and invasive procedure symptoms that disappear with just reducing exposure to microwave radiation. A law firm filed a federal lawsuit with evidence of how cell phones used by our children emit more than five times the levels allowed by federal law, when even short doses of radiation about the federal safety limits causes harm even to healthy and strong adults. Seven law firms are warning the school officials of the potential civil and criminal liability of exposing children unnecessarily to harmful microwave and 5G radiation when an expensive hardwire <coughs> broadband internet is readily available. According to experts, electrosensitivity is not an isolated of symptoms, but ongoing injuries to the immunological and neurological systems, which are progressively aggravating to reversibility by exposure to microwave radiation. Some of the symptoms of EHS include pain, swelling of vital organs, swelling of face, head and eyes, symptoms of heart attack and stroke, rashes and loss of skin, flu, allergies, the symptoms, and the stomach, sleeping, vision, clear, memory, speech, concentration, and breathing problems, headaches, palpitations, sarvidinous, chest pain high and low blood pressure, seizures, paralysis, unconsciousness, nose bleeding, internal bleeding, fever, tremors, involuntary movements, dizziness, nausea, irritability, depression, anxiety, fatigue, weakness, muscle and joint pain, painful cramps, numbness, tooth pain, gum swelling and blisters, altered sugar levels, impaired sense of smell, miscarriages and birth defects. Scientific studies prove most doctors are confounded in the symptoms of EHS with symptoms of other illnesses, including autism, ADHD, dyslexia, PTSD, and heart attack and stroke, multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, hypothyroidism, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic fatigue syndrome, diabetes, and major depression and suicidal tendencies, as detailed by the request to protect the children submitted to the Secretary of the U.S. Department of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, and posted on the case law materials or wireless watch blog, wireless watch blog. Ladies and gentlemen, your prompt response to this evidence can save the lives of children and teachers and of other defenseless and unsuspecting victims. Thank you very much for giving serious consideration of this matter. Respectfully, thank you again. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mendoza. Appreciate it. Our last speaker is Ms. Mary Lowe. Ms. Lowe, you can say your name and address, please. Ms. Lowe is not on with us right now. So that was that was the last speaker. Thank you, Jorge. We'll move on into the report to the superintendent. Item, our first item is the canvas the election results from the May 1st, 2021 school board election. Dr. Ryan. This item is to canvas the uh, official results of uh, the election. Uh, of May the 1st, 2021, the board of trustees will inspect the cumulative report official and the voter results of each precinct report furnished by the Tarrant County Elections Office. There is a slight change since this uh, was posted. And so I will read the total votes that are the official uh, from the official uh, results from Tarrant County that they got to us this week. In place one, Shannon Braun, 5,203 votes. Minnie McClure, 4,276 votes. Sergio Harris, 1,391 votes. Therefore, a runoff election is required for place one. In place two, Becky St. John, 5,767 votes. Stetson Clark, 5,067 votes. Those are the official uh, reports. The recommendations for the board trustees to approve the canvas of the election returns and name Becky St. John as the winner in place two of May 1st, 2021, Board of Trustees election for Grapevine Collierville Independent School District. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for this recommendation? Jorge? Thank you. In a second? I'll second. Louis, thank you. Any uh, questions, comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries 7 0. With that, we move on to item B. We'll act on the order of the school trustee runoff election. Dr. Ryan? Yes, as I mentioned, uh, there is a runoff election scheduled for Ju June the 5th, 2021, the first Saturday in June. The order of the school trustee election calls for a runoff election to fill an opening for the three year term in place one. Early voting, early voting locations include the record grapevine and the Colleyville City Hall. Additional locations for early voting and election day voting by personal appearance shall be published by the Tarrant County Elections Voting. Elections will also be published in the notice of election. The recommendations for the board trustees to order a school trustee runoff election for place one for Saturday, June 5th, 2021. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I make a motion to approve the recommendation. Thank you, Coley. Now I have a second. Casey, a second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? 
We have one correction yes, on page nine uh, in the official packet. Uh, we've got a, a incorrect date. That date has been corrected in the um, in the replacement page for that for page nine. Okay. Oh, and that's all. We have that. Everybody has that on there. Yes. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none. All those in favor? Motion carries seven zero. Move on to item C. Consider giving notice a proposed non renewal of an employee's term contract. Dr. Ryan. Yes, sir. the board has been informed um, of uh, this particular situation. And, and so we are at this point um, um, going to um, uh, propose non renewal. The recommendation is for the board of trustees to approve giving notice of proposed non renewal to Pamela Honeycutt and direct the superintendent to provide timely notice to Pamela Honeycutt. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? Mindy? I move that the board give notice of proposed non-renewal to Pamela Honeycutt and direct the superintendent to provide timely notice to the employee. Thank you, Mindy. And a second? Casey, a second? Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we'll vote. All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Those are all of our action items tonight. We'll move on to item D, release of the ESSER 3 American Recovery Plan Funds and the application development requirements. Dr. Ryan. Yes, yeah, so of course, this is the ESSER 3. Uh, uh, these are the funds that we've been hearing uh, some about in the, in the media about coming to school districts. Uh, I've asked uh, Ms. Tovar to give you a, um, a brief overview of these funds. I wish we had all of the answers to every question uh, at this point. We don't have the rules. We don't have all the answers to the questions uh, that we would like to have. Uh, those will be forthcoming uh, throughout the summer. But Ms. Tovar uh, is aware of uh, 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 kind of the introduction to ESSER 3. So, um, Ms. Tovar. introduction and uh, trustees good evening yes, today we are going to introduce um, some information about the ESSER 3 American Recovery Plan funds and those application development requirements and so under um, that ESSER grant application process this uh, meeting was where we are fulfilling this one requirement where superintendents must brief their boards on the one-time nature of these federal funds and that school systems should not anticipate that ongoing replacement funds will be provided at either the federal or state level. So ESSER 3 at a glance, this is the elementary and secondary school emergency relief uh, funds that came from the American Recovery uh, Plan. And the funds uh, are actually available back to March 13, 2020 and extend through September 30, 2024. So essentially for three years. So it's two years, plus you always have that one year to carry forward. So what we're um, looking at right now in terms of our initial award would be 6,094.99 divided essentially um, over three years um, through, uh, through the life of that particular grant. It is intended um, to not be, um, uh, it's intended to be supplemental to our state funding. I know some of us yesterday and this morning were watching um, some legislative updates where there is a, a um, I guess a bill that has been uh, voted out of the Senate committee to talk about um, how reasonable is it that school districts could spend that amount of money? Because uh, ultimately that's only two thirds of our award to be more like 9 million altogether when they released all of it. Is it realistic that we could spend that amount of money in uh, under three in three years and that they would want to um, work on a plan to try to hold some of the money um, in reserve as TEA to do this. Um, I think that'll continue to have some discussion through it. One of the things in the TAA letter back around April 28th, um, when they told us about the funds, they did talk about the idea that they were not to be, um, these funds were not going to be supplanted at the state level. But at the very bottom of the letter, it did talk about some um, legislative things that they were still going to need to work out towards the end. So. Um, it's certainly something to watch. Um, we're going to begin planning um, as a, you know, for all of the needs that we have. The process really and truly includes 
starting with talking to your community about what are the needs of the students in relation to the safely reopening of schools if you haven't already opened as well as uh, safely operating them in the future and then also addressing the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on the students and so identifying all of those needs quite often will if, when you start talking to school people and parents and students and community members about the needs that you have identified over let's say the last 18 months um, you're probably going to come up with um, probably more than six or nine million dollars worth of things one of the things that's uh, listed on the list that you could do for example and we'll talk about what you can and can't do here in a minute might be to um, revamp your air filtration system, uh, systems with HVAC so I talked to Paula Barbaro and you know you know what that might that would probably be more than six million to certainly do one building let alone all of our facilities and so but still what you do is you make that big list and then we're going to come together to prioritize those needs and attach strategies as well as budget estimates of those strategies to figure out what we can do and what we can do when with the funds and so if the funds are more we'll already have some ideas and if the funds are less we'll know where to start and maybe what we may have to do later the, the uh, application is due at the end of july um, typically with our federal funds if we're going to do a year-round salary for a person might start in july we would want to go ahead and have that stamped in by june 30th before that next fiscal year starts and so um, that is our the timeline that we are working backwards from is before that june 30 date so some of the requirements we are going to have to post a safe to return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan within 30 days of getting our notice of grant award so once they do approve um, our um, application for our funds then we would need to put that information out there not just what we are going to spend the funds on but then also to this safe to return to in-person instruction and what those services are going to look like from the district we also have to continue to implement safety protocols to safely reopen our schools for in-person. We also have to maintain, um, there's a maintenance of effort as well as maintenance of equity requirements that we would have to maintain. And this is the big one that we're working on right now really, is this meaningful consultation with our stakeholders, including students and students first, families, district and campus personnel, community, civil rights organizations, well, because we're trying to really get at um, representing the needs of all of our students, but then also to um, what has been observed to be disproportionately um, a greater negative impact on certain underserved populations or a greater negative impact on our students with disabilities, experiencing homelessness, ELs, and migrant students. And so we're going to need to make sure that we get input from representatives uh, for those students as well. Then we have to document how we're going to prioritize our needs and then they do want us to spend at least 20% of our money on those evidence-based interventions, such as summer learning, extended day, after-school programs, these sorts of things, specifically for learning loss mitigation, but then also ensure that those interventions are also designed to address academic, social, and emotional needs and the disproportionate impact of coronavirus on student populations. And so when you think about um, the past 18 months and we think about the different layers of loss that students and teachers and staff members and community members have all experienced um, through this time that you kind of do have i would say layers of trauma that might interfere with a student's readiness to learn um, or um, emotional state of feeling cared for so some of those requirements that they speak to uh, may not necessarily look directly like an academic intervention but as we start working into it, there may be some sort of needs of the students and of our staff that we're going to need to address to help them be successful. So in terms of the application process, um, where we have come right, are right now is we're in that comprehensive needs assessment with our stakeholders. Our A team and department committees have, our A team and our departments have been um, exposed to um, this information as well. And we have given them some tools to help them identify you know what would be um, if I had what, the one less problem what would that problem be that would help us be, move towards um, mitigating that learning loss as well as um, larger um, strategies and larger items that they've noticed that are pretty um, problems that the students are facing 
We've also last night I met with the district excellence committee and briefed them and has provided them with some tools for feedback and the link that we use in terms of the survey is reusable. So, for example, if the member of the DEC is a parent, um, then that, hey, they are more than welcome to then let their student reuse that link so that we can collect that as a student response and see what they think as well about um, what is it that they need moving forward or um, what do we need to prioritize um, coming um, as we come into this school year? Like, for example, um, one of the things on the grant is it asks you to tell you when you're going to spend the funds and the first slot of time to spend funds would be this summer. Well, um, yes, you might be eager to leap in there and start mitigating learning loss and doing some extra time with students. But if the students aren't emotionally prepared and the teachers are exhausted, you know, your community might say, well, you know what, maybe we shouldn't start in June or July. Maybe we should start at this point. So there's places where it'll work that way. After we collect all of this feedback through the month of May, um, Dr. Schnauz and Dan, we're all working together to create what Dr. Schnauz has named the ESSER Innovation Team. And we're right now we're working over the different categories of uh, people that we'll have helping us. The idea is to finish that program evaluation and or finish that needs assessment evaluation, figuring out what we need to include in our program, as well as transition planning, because as it was so aptly put, uh, pointed out earlier, that the grant funds do eventually um, run out over the three years and that they don't want you to be um, have not planned for some sort of moving away from these supplemental services. The idea is that you would use things you could address and mitigate that learning loss. And as the students and teachers, everyone got stronger, then you start to phase those things out. And then they would also help us with that grant closeout and compliance report. And they are asked to uh, then meet with us every six months or so to look at the spending, the strategies, and are those strategies working? After that, we're going to align all of our strategies to our needs. We develop that budget, which, you know, it's funny, it's that one little, bit, uh, one little bullet. It's probably a little more complex than that, certainly. But then in June, we'll come back to you with what the community um, has said to us, as well as those priorities to share that plan with you and provide that opportunity for public comment and then be able to um, submit that prior to June 30 and then post once we um, have our NOGA or Notice of Grand Award, be able to post that return to uh, in-person instruction plan. So just briefly to use your, the ESSER funds, uh, these are the ESSER three funds. This is the kind of the process I was just describing. For overall, the main thing at the our forefront is the hopes, dreams, and aspirations our community has for our children. And then we'll be using some data to help us figure out how far away from those hopes, dreams, and aspirations are we to help us identify those problems as well as the root causes. One of the reasons we've asked our principals to also visit with our CECs is you may have several campuses that have something that looks like the same problem. However, they may not have the same root cause of their problem as we've talked about before. And so giving them that chance to tell us what their strategies should be for their campuses. And then we'll strategize, as I mentioned. And the last piece there is just with the EGGER requirements. Is it allowable? Is it allocable? Is it reasonable? And so are you paying too much for something? Have you started something that's going to be unsustainable in the future? And then, of course, there's just the general list of things that just um, are not allowed. So here are some things that you can use. Um, they do have a list of things you cannot do. So, for example, um, someone might say, well, what if we could pay down some of our bond debt with that six million? Well, you're not allowed to use these funds for that purpose. Um, it also mentions, I always have this theory that if there's a rule, that means somebody was doing something, you know, like you cannot purchase alcohol with federal funds. There's a list. So we have the list. Um, certainly, won't, hopefully won't have any of those uh, people requesting those sorts of things. But here are some things we can do, some things that maybe we have already done. And so we'll be able to also look backward in time with our committee to say, should we go back and ask for some pre-award costs on some of these things that we have already done? Or do we want to focus these funds on moving forward? So here they are essentially with those activities to address those unique needs of the students. If there were some school facility repair and improvement, address that learning loss, educational technology, continue to employ your existing staff. Those are the sorts of things that you can use those funds um, over the next three years to accomplish. Are there any questions? Does anyone have any questions for Shannon on how we can, uh, Becky? <clears throat> So um, in the first slide there, we're talking about utilizing the 
uh, campus excellence committees and the district's excellence committee. Is that something that we're only going to do in just this first small time frame before the end of June? And um, I know, I mean, quite frankly, one issue we have is even the members on those committees are somewhat difficult to find. Some of the campuses have them listed on their websites and others do not. Um, so is there going to be an opportunity? And number one, I think we need to get those names out there so that people know who's who's on the CECs and the DEC. And then the other thing is, um, will there be an opportunity for like PTA input, um, other organizations that might be able to kind of cast a little bit wider net? I don't know that our booster clubs, oh, that, that may be a little far, but um, can you speak? To that a so bit. one of the suggestions when I was listening to the first half of the training um, yesterday with his name is Corey Green. He's kind of the lead person at TEA for these sorts of things. And one piece of advice they did give was they talked about this idea. Of, we know it's a really compressed timeline mm -hmm. and you won't necessarily have all of your data back. And so we know and expect for you to revisit this thing every six months or so. So it, there may be new data that comes to light. There is still opportunity for new information or if the needs of the children change, these sorts of things for us to be able to amend and make those changes. If they're substantial enough, we would come back to you all um, to work on what that went if that made a big change to the plan overall. But that does give us a chance to continue to collect feedback in an ongoing way and work together to make sure that the strategies we have in place are meeting the needs of the grant. Okay, right. Because that was my next question is with that with that deadline there, you know, I mean we Kids are finishing their star test tomorrow and um, we've still got makeup tests going on. Not that I really put oh, anyway, never mind. Um, to your point, though, we don't necessarily have a whole lot of data because we aren't even at the end of the school year yet. So knowing what student needs might be, that picture isn't complete yet. And so how you said they're going to allow us to revisit this plan, like if we tell them you know, we're going to tutor every kid at Greyhound High School and then come to find out, oh, only half the kids at Greyhound High School need tutoring. Are we going to be able to have some flexibility in our plans? So in regards to the application itself, when I've seen looked at the sample that they have, it's not quite that granular. It does ask okay. us to say, what are you going to do this summer? What are you going to do this school year? Like that, but it has categories of activities. It doesn't necessarily say, you know, which students at GHS or wherever, for example. And so... Um, in our thinking about it, we could say that we're going to have, you know, targeted student groups or if it's everyone through tier one instruction or what it is, we'll be able to do those sorts of things without having to amend the grant. But if there was a big change in one of the, um, the, the features as far as are we spending this on payroll, are we spending it in other places like that, then, you know, that might require an amendment. Okay, so we don't have to get that detailed. We can stay pretty high level as far as our plan. Okay, um, and then... Um, Oh, I had a plan question. Um, kind of going back, I want to make sure that we do, you know, get that input from our stakeholders with regard to summer, right? So on the one hand, we already knew we were going to be offering summer school. And obviously some of the things that we're doing during summer school look like they could be reimbursable under this. Um, I guess that would be one thing that I would be looking for from as you're gathering this stakeholder input is what what needs do we see that are kind of above and beyond uh, what we were already planning to do in the first place versus what's reimbursable, right? So that, I mean, I know too, they're going to have a special session. I hope we get to keep our whole six million. I'm already hearing things I don't like um, out of what the special session could be doing. But, um, you know, if there is a... You know, if we had money, we could do this, right? Something above and beyond. I, I would hope that, you know, maybe we're able to take advantage of an opportunity here, um, knowing full well, and we've been here before, right? The 2011 um, uh, budget cuts, as well as the, the um, uh, stimulus monies that we got back then, we know not to, you know, fund ongoing things with this. But if there's something, you know, or some things out there that we can do that that help mitigate some of those impacts. I, I really, the last phone call that we had, the trustees had with the commissioner, um, I would say that focusing really hard on students was a huge um, 
issue, huge focus, huge, um, you know, is six million dollars isn't going to go very far with our HVAC systems, but it might go pretty far in terms of some significant student supports in all kinds. I mean, you mentioned all sorts of student populations there that we want to be able to look at. So I, th I think that would be what I would be looking at more too is and, and again, we don't know what all those impacts are going to be yet. We aren't even at the end of the school year. So. Yeah, and I guess, Becky, I just want to add, and to your point, we really want to maximize the, the, the student achievement side of things. And so that's really where the primary focus is, is how do we, um, you know, prevent, close, whatever those learning gaps that exist, how do we, how do we shut those down, you know, as, as quickly as possible? And so, like you said, we're, we're keeping the student, that, that student learning piece at the epicenter of this. And I know we're all excited about the 6 million. I don't want to be Debbie Downer here, but this, we're, this isn't set in stone. This $6 million is not set in stone. Am I correct in that? I think that until when we get the notice of grant award that tells us this is your, these are your dollars, then I think we would all feel more confident that it was set in stone. Yes, but this is the, the amount they've given us as our allocation, but apparently there is some currently some discussion at the legislative level about um, how much you could have when and how that impacts um, the application itself. So right now we're all just kind of proceeding with the application the way TEA has provided it, which is this is your planning amount of six million, and then we need you to look over the for the planning for the next three years the way the application is built. So they tell us we have the six plus. So our applications due in July. So we have our meetings. Just so I'm, I'm I'm understanding exactly our process here. So we have all of our stakeholders, our students, and everyone give their input. Applications due by the 27th, and then from there. So from there, uh, they would give us our notice, what they call notice of grant award, and we'd be able to see what those, um, you know, the the final the funds that are there. Um, how long does that take? That's that's where I'm trying to. What is our? Do we have any idea what our time frame here sure. is? So a lot of times with our other title one, two, three, and four funds, we also submit that one um, in the beginning um, before July, so around that last little part of June, and usually it's back within a matter of weeks. Okay. Good. Any yeah, other? So any other questions? The money? Nope. Dr. Ryan, would you? Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you. We'll keep the board posted on our progress. Um, we the first thing is the application. So even though they have uh, designated these funds, you still have to apply for the grant. So we're we'll working on that next. If we ask for more, if we can't, <laughs> <laughs> not to be stingy. <laughs> Okay, uh, move on to consent agenda. Do I have a motion for the consent agenda? Um, yes, yeah, so there's just a one item on the consent agenda. We thought there were gonna be uh, one or two more, but we just had one item and it uh, really allows us to uh, uh, get going quicker in our HR department as uh, uh, you know, if uh, these are uh, approved. And so the recommendations for the board trustees to approve the May 12th, 2021 personnel report. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. Do I have a motion for the recommendation? I move that we accept Dr. Ryan's recommendation. Thank you. In a second. Second. Louie, thank you very much. Any questions? None. Seeing none. All those in favor? And carry 7 0. I will say that uh, we just hired a uh, director of uh, fine arts uh, that we're excited about. So thank you very much for your support from the, from the board level. Paul Sykes is on this list. So that's the new director of fine arts. Can I ask where he's from? You can sure ask. And um, he's coming directly from uh, uh, Texas Westland. Uh, he has had a couple of different uh, stops at, um, at a university on the Brazos that we're all very fond of. Uh, Texas A&M University, Casey, just in case you're wondering which one on the Brazos we were talking about, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're excited. He's uh, 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 has tremendous background in um, 
uh, band programs across the state of Texas in high school and in college. And so we're excited for Paul to join us. Very exciting. Thank you. Do you have any announcements? A lot. May is always such a fun month, a busy month, but such a great and fun month. So we'll start next week with two of our graduations. Um, it's an exciting time. Um, I guess that's on Wednesday, Bridges and Collegiate Academy. And go from there. No announcements. We'll be out on Friday for another graduation that we have in our family. So uh, be down at eight a.m. with the, our youngest is uh, graduating from him. So. Oh, how they keep getting older, and we're not. <laughs> Didn't need that much laughter, but that's okay. So I need a motion to adjourn. If no other announcements, do we? Motion that we adjourn. Thank you, Louie. In a second. Casey, a second. All those in favor? Motion carries 7-0. Meeting is adjourned at 6-20. Thank you, guys. You have a good night.